Welcome to Sisters Conversations Podcast with your hostess, Latrice Carter. We feature interviews in literary, film, and television, as well as real topics that impact the black community. Welcome to Sisters Conversations with Latrice Carter and my co-host and guest today with attorney Palyra Henderson-Smith. As you all know, every fourth Thursday, we take we talk about wealth, and this week we're diving into the importance of having a will, a health proxy, and a power of attorney. But before we get started, let me introduce my guest and co-host today, attorney Palyra Henderson-Smith, who is also our in-house expert in wealth and estate planning for Sisters Place Magazine. Welcome to the show, Palyra. Tell our listeners a little bit about what you do. Thank you, Latrice, and hello, everyone. So um, my name is Pilara, and I am an attorney with a, a focus on estate planning. And so what that basically means is that I help people put plans together for life transitions, um, stealing from an incapac- incapacity or mental incapacity and death. And so we put plans together so that when that time comes, um, that change can be something that's positive, um, that you can really concentrate on the person that's going through the transition, as well as supporting each other and not trying to find documents and put things in place and make hard decisions during that time. You're prepared. Absolutely. Great. Now, in the Black community, it's not common to have a legitimate will or power of attorney, or even a health proxy. This is not something we are taught as we were coming up, but we see how important this is for us to have after attending personally funerals um, of our loved ones, where where, where people are fighting over these assets that no one really has a stake in unless there's an actual will. You know, um, people feud, they fight, it's, it's, it's very agonizing, it's very frustrating, and it's very stressful. And it's unnecessary if we have the right tools in place so that we can leave our assets legitimately to those that we love. So let's jump in and get started with some questions. Um, Palara, tell us, what is a will? So a will basically is a tool um, that gives direction for the wrapping up of your affairs. And so the distribution of all of your remaining property, the appointment of an executor who is someone that will manage um, the property for you over the estate, and then the nomination of a guardian for your minor children or if you have disabled adult children. Okay, okay, okay. So why is this so important for us to have a legitimate will? And I say a legitimate will because some people write it out on a piece of paper and say, okay, I have, read this when I die. (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, and, and it's not legitimate, really. So it's it's not necessarily legitimate. And um, so a, a will is important because it allows you to, to decide who should receive your property, how much of the property they should receive. Um, it allows you to decide who should care for your children um, in your absence. And if you don't have a will, every state basically has one for you. So someone at the end will make those decisions for you. So the the thing is, do you want to make your informed choices yourself or do you want to go based off of a kind of blanket generic law that's put into place? Um, And so it's important, right? These are things that you have gathered that are important to you that can really make a difference to those that you leave behind, but you have to prepare. You have to do the work. Yes, you do. You actually, yes, you do. And um, I have a will just so, you know, I want to share with our listeners. Um, it's, it's really important for me to have a will because I have a child and, you know, I want to be able to leave a legacy. That's the other thing a will does. A will can leave a legacy for your children and their grandchildren. So, you know, it, it, we need to be um, proactive in the Black community when it comes to leaving wealth instead of leaving debt. Um, 
that's and 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 I know that's another whole another topic, but I just want to put that out there, and we will be touching over this in the coming weeks um, as well. Now, um, Palara, is it expensive to have a will drawn up? It's not expensive to have a will. I know lots of people think that in order to come see an attorney and to have a will, you're going to be out thousands of dollars, but that's just not the truth. Um, a will is just really a couple of hundred dollars um, in, in order to have an attorney do it. I mean, I charge three seventy five dollars for a will. And so, um, and that's everything, you know, that has to do with it. So that's sitting down talking with me, going through everything that needs to to happen, having it executed the proper way, it's really not expensive at all. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm a witness because um, she is my attorney. <laughs> I just want to throw that out there. I'm sorry, y'all. I'm, I'm going to promote her and just pull, throw her out there because she is very good at what she does. And I truly, truly appreciate her. And we have a beautiful friendship that has formed a, a, in this. And it's so funny. We met at a vendor event. You remember we, that yeah. a couple years yes, ago? I do. We most certainly did. And I think both of us would say it was more beneficial business to business, right? From that event. <laughs> yes, absolutely. 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 Now, I know I, I, I've known some people who have written on a piece of paper um, what they want their belongings to go to and who they want to go to. And in their minds, they think, well, I had it notarized. So that makes it legal. Can you tell us, is this a legal document? Can, can that stand up in court? Unfortunately, that is not a legal document. That's a nice piece of paper with a nice notary stamp on it. But unfortunately, um, that's all that is. That's not a valid will at all. Now, um, what they are attempting to do is something called a holographic will, which is you write it out in your hand and then you sign it but most states do not recognize holographic wills. Illinois is one of those states that does not recognize a holographic will. So simply because you write it and you sign it and you take it to have it notarized, it is not a valid will. Um, In order for that to be a valid will, now you can write, you can handwrite your will, but it still has to be executed the proper way. There's still the formalities that must happen in order for that to become a valid will, meaning, it has to be witnessed properly. It has to be um, attested to properly. Um, and so there's lots of different steps that has to happen in order for that to be a valid will, right? So you have to be of sound mind and memory when you are writing that will. So it has to be signed in the presence of two witnesses, meaning the witnesses have to see each other sign. They have to see you sign. You have to see them sign, right? They have to be willing to say that you are of sound mind and memory and that they are over 18. And so there's lots of different formalities that needs to to happen. And so the problem is that people write those wills, they take it and have it notarized. And that means absolutely nothing. In the state of Illinois, and in most states, a will doesn't have to be notarized at all. So that stuff alone does absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so for all of those of you that I've chatted with in the past, you know, in a recent group, um, this is really important. You may have written this out, but it's, it's not Illinois does. And these, and these people live in Illinois, um, that will that you wrote out on hand is not legal. It will not be recognized. It will not be recognized. Um, so tell everyone what happens when a loved one of yours passes and they do not have a will. What happens? So if someone passes and they don't have a will, like I said, there is one that's written for you. It's written by the laws of the state. And so that is considered when you are done intestate. And so it will go based on the laws of the, the state. Basically, it says if you are married and have children, your spouse will get half of your estate and your children will get the other half an equal share. So that means if you have two children, They'll get half and that half will get split two ways. If you don't have children and you only have a spouse, then your spouse will get the whole. Um, But there's a process in order for all of this to happen. And there's court involvement, which is considered probate, which we could probably talk about that another day because I know a lot of people are a little confused about what probate means. And simply because um, the laws are 
are in place, it doesn't mean that these things just happen automatically, which I know a lot of people think that they do. Well, I don't need a will. I'm married. I don't have any kids. And so everything's just going to my spouse. And so we're all good. <laughs> so um, that seems like that's a, a legitimate thing that can happen, but that's not quite how that happens. And then you still need to plan for well, what happens when your spouse passes away. Um, so there's lots of layers in there that unfortunately kind of get skipped over or left out or not addressed. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and that's definitely something we're going to definitely touch base on next month, guys, um, with probate, especially if you have a, you have life, you have a life insurance policy and you don't have a will, uh, how how that gets treated. Cause will that go through probate as well, Pilar? So here's the thing, and a lot of people don't realize this, there are certain things that are considered contractual, and because they are contractual, they won't go through probate at all, nor are they governed by your will, which is why this is an important conversation to have. Um, So for instance, you just brought up life insurance. Mm -hmm. So if you have a life insurance policy, say you took it out when you first turned 21, got your first job, and you wasn't married, didn't have kids, and possibly you put down your parents as the beneficiary. Well, 20 years later, you still have that same insurance policy and it still lists your parents. Now though, you're married or you have kids or all of the above, guess where that insurance policy is going? It's going to your parents. So it doesn't matter that you've written out a will and you said that I want everything to go to my, my spouse and then from my spouse, I want everything to go to my kids. That's considered contractual. And so it's all going to your parents. And so there's been situations where it's gone to parents, it's gone to past boyfriends and girlfriends, it's gone to ex-spouses. So Mm. it's really important that there's some planning and there's some conversations and that you really understand how the whole process works. Mm -hmm. And just by you saying that, I'm going to have to go back and look at my life insurance policy uh, that I've had since I was 26 years old. (laughs) And my daughter is, I know she's listed as the main beneficiary, but I also, uh, at the time when I had that policy, I also had custody of my little sister. So I need to go back and make sure I make changes to that so that um, my daughter is 100%. Um, he's the primary, mm-hmm. yes, the primary. Not I know I have I, I have her listed as primary but I also have secondary I think secondary is my sister okay so I need to go back and see guys this is see it's it important. important there's some life changes happening that you might not want your sister named as the, the secondary anymore yes yes now because I have a will and I know we had talked about this before um I think you told me I need to change my life, um, one of the beneficiaries on my life insurance to the estate of Latrice Carter, which is my will, correct? Yes, um, because of how you want things distributed. Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah. So see, guys, see, I'm asking questions that relate to not to just me, but I'm pretty sure they relate to you guys as well. So, yeah, so I, I'm making a mental note. And when I know we got the phone, I'll make a note to call my insurance. <laughs> And if you have not requested a copy of your life insurance policy, get a co- get a new copy so you can so you can go back and see what's in it. And you know, because when you sit down to prepare a will with your attorney, you need to have every life insurance policy that you have. Now, let me be clear: your life insurance policy. That, okay, so that life insurance policy that your job took out on you. You know, if you quit your job, that policy don't follow you. That's not included. <laughs> you know, and because I have to help people understand that. And we will be talking more about this in the next series about life insurance. We're going to jump right all into all of that, um, you know, because some people misunderstand. I was talking with a coworker a couple of days ago mm-hmm. and she said, I have life insurance through my job. I don't have to get a separate policy. But you do because, you know, understand the technicalities of that policy. Yeah, that policy will not follow you if you no longer have that job and so normally when you need it the most is when you no longer have that job that job yep yep and that has happened to a couple people that I know who are you know we sat and we had a conversation and she is no longer with the company and she you know we were talking I was she called me and she's like well I I still have you know I got the benefits and I still have my life the company policy you no longer have that 
when you depart from that company, guess what? They cancel that policy. Those premiums are no longer paid. Yep, because they're they're being paid by the your employer at, at a certain um, two times your salary, two three times your salary depends on what role you in. Um, like for example, myself, you know, yes, my employer has a, a life insurance policy that um, I that they have for me that's three times my salary. But guess what? I have a separate life insurance policy um, because I know that that you know if I were to depart leave that company and and the good lord called me home tomorrow guess what that policy is void right from my employer right that policy is part of your benefits package yes. and so if you are not employed you no longer have a benefits package therefore they're no longer paying the premium and so you cannot count on that that fund mm-hmm. right. especially in, like for those that retire too you know when we retire from a job you know you no longer have those benefits you have retirement benefits but you don't have the life insurance policy that came. Probably with- not, unless for some reason that was negotiated in your your terms. Um, mm-hmm. But you have to make sure that that's something that was negotiated. And if it's not, that's normally something that does cease. Yeah, yeah. So having a life insurance and having a will, they put they they go hand in hand, guys. But like I said, we're gonna next month's show. We're gonna really dive into the life insurance and probate, like like Polara said, because. That's really, there's so many uh, uh, nuances that go with that, that you all need to be aware of. And for the Black community, we need to be more proactive having a will instead of when the, when a loved one dies, you go to these GoFundMe pages and you're asking other people to help you bury your loved ones. You sh- Life insurance is not expensive, and having a will is not expensive either. We need to be more proactive, um, leaving wealth instead of debt. And, you know, because um, when you ask family members to help bury your loved one, that is debt. That's not legacy. That's not wealth at all. And I've seen this so much on Facebook and Instagram. You name it, it's all over social media. You know, you raise the money so you can bury your child, your child, your sister, your brother, your parents, because they did not have a will. They did not have life insurance. So um, we want you guys to take notes and really, you know, and drop your questions in our um, in our podcast group. We'll be very happy to answer any questions you may have. Absolutely, and absolutely. Here, and reach out to Polara. She's going to give her information at the end, but reach out to her. You know, um, she is here to ask, answer any questions you may have. Now, on to um, health proxy. Um, why should you get a health? Why should anyone get a health proxy? Because why would you want anyone else to make your healthcare decisions for you? I mean, that's the main reason right there. You don't want to allow anyone else to make your healthcare decisions for you. Um, and not everyone knows exactly what you would want. And so you need to be able to articulate that to someone, this is the type of care that I want. This is not the type of care that I do not want. Um, and so that someone knows that because when the time comes for a healthcare proxy to come into play, that is a very emotional time, very emotional time. And those are some very hard choices and hard decisions that you have to make sometimes, whether or not someone should have artificial assistance, um, whether or not someone should have a procedure form. And that's just one of those things that's very personal. And so it's much better for you to make those decisions for yourself. I think that most people um, are probably very familiar with the Terry Schiavo case from the 90s. most people are, are familiar with that. So that was a case where um, Terry Schiavo, she had a massive heart attack and became unresponsive. And the doctors basically um, declared that she was um, brain dead. And her husband, who had been named as her guardian, eventually wanted to take her off of the feeding tubes and ventilation. And her parents disagreed. Her parents thought that she should remain on and he argued she would not want to live this way, but because there was nothing in writing saying that she would not want to live this way, nor had she talked to her parents about it, 
it lingered for seven years in the court system, seven years. And so this is the thing that happens. If you have a healthcare proxy, you have taken charge and you've written down and you've made it very clear what your choices are. And so it takes it out of the hands of your loved ones to try to figure out what your choices are. So if that piece of paper had existed, it would be very easy for the parents to say, we don't want our daughter to be taken off. However, this is what she wants. And as hard as this decision is to make, we're going to make that decision based off of what she wants. Mm -hmm. But because it didn't exist and the husband had basically gone to court and been named as the guardian and named as the guardian means that he had the right to make those decisions. But when you are in that situation, someone else has the right to contest that decision. Mm -hmm. And so then that's why you end up in front of a judge trying to make your argument and figure out whose argument is the best argument. And on that particular thing, it took seven years. Eventually, the courts did side with the husband. But imagine what type of quality of life that was for her for seven, seven years. years. Wow. That is a long time. And that didn't, it didn't benefit her. It didn't benefit the husband. It didn't benefit the parents. Mm -hmm. That is just a very drawn out, sad, awful situation for everyone involved. And so as much as we don't want to make decisions that we know ultimately are going to end in someone losing their lives. We all know that eventually death is a part of our life. Mm -hmm. And so why not let that be as dignified um, as it possibly can be and on the terms that you want it to be. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if it's important to you to have every procedure under the moon tried, then you can say that. My quantity of life is more important and I want you to try everything that you possibly can try to save me. And that's okay. But if you are someone that says, no, the quality of my life is more important and what I'm leaving behind, I don't want you spending thousands upon thousands of dollars trying to save me and have me in a home with tubes and things, then that's okay too. Mm -hmm. But you just need to be able to say it. And someone needs to know that that's what you want. And you need to have someone in place. This is probably the most important piece with the healthcare yeah. proxy is to pick a person that will actually carry out your wishes. Yes. Right. That is strong enough to say that this is not based on my choices it's based on your choices. And I'm going to actually do what you want me to do. Yes. So you got to make sure you get the right person. And you know what? My mother uh, has me as her health proxy mm -hmm. and she added a DNR to her health proxy I and it was the hardest this. thing for mm -hmm. us to accept for all of us to accept mm -hmm. and my sister being a being in healthcare, she explained to me the process of when she's witnessing them having to revive a patient especially an elderly patient mm -hmm. and she walked me through she goes their ribs be you know their ribs are bruised it, it's very painful you know, she said, that is not an easy task. And you have to understand why mama wants a DNR in her, in her, in her health, you know, in her health proxy. Absolutely. You know? And it, it was really hard for me to accept, but I had to accept it. And now that she's relocated, we're working on getting that transferred to the state that she lives in because the one that she had in place was when she was living in Wisconsin. So now we have to transfer that to the state, the new state that she's living in. So most states, it is reciprocal. So oh, okay. if you don't have a new one yet, it's it's okay. okay. So um, okay. the state will still recognize the one as long as it was validly um, executed in Wisconsin. Okay. Okay. Now, a lot of times uh, attorneys, including myself, I will recommend that if you permanently relocate to redo some of those documents, simply because it's familiar with the state. And okay. so when you're in an emergency situation, it's much better to have your healthcare professionals have a document that they are familiar with, Okay, which means that they can act quickly as opposed to trying to figure out, is this exactly mm -hmm. what should okay. happen here? But it's not that it's not valid. So it is a valid document. And so okay. you're covered for now. And so it's fine. 
Um, you know, you can look at the new document and see, is it pretty much comparable? Is it a significant difference? And, and decide whether or not you should update it okay. or upgrade it, especially okay. if she has decided that she wants something different or she wants to name someone different. Okay. Then okay. That, that is good to know. That is good to know because um, I was just talking to her doctor and let him, the new doctor in, in her in Mississippi know that, hey, she has a, um, she has, I am her health proxy and I need to send you guys these documents. Where would I send it? Who and, you know, who I would send it to? And she gave me the information and she just had me to kind of give her like um, the logistics. And I, and that was, I said, well, I think the most important thing you need to know is that she has a DNR in here. And so they made note of that just in case, you know, she were to go into the hospital and God forbid, you know. Right. Um, so she said, well, that, she said that that's important. And then, you know, any other things. And I know now with her being in the South, she's like, I want, she wants to be buried next to her parents. Well, you know what, that's not in, in the information, you know, it, it, we have the Wisconsin burial place in there. So I'm like, okay, I see some changes, some things, areas where need changes need to be updated. So, yeah. yeah. Yes, I can hear that. So there are some things that probably definitely need to be up, updated and upgraded in that. And, um, and so once you have that new document in place, mm-hmm. then it's important to get it to her primary care physician. If she goes into the hospital for any type of procedures, make sure it becomes part of her chart. Mm-hmm. Um, because she does have that DNR, it may even be a good idea to have a copy of it on the refrigerator mm-hmm. because of um, emergency personnel are called to the home for some reason, mm-hmm. they are normally trained to look there first to see okay. if it's something like a DNR or a pulse in place. Um, mm-hmm. The pulse is, is similar to a DNR. It's just a phys- physician's order. Um, and so it's really similar. So they look and see what okay. is it that we should do in this emergency situation because default is, right, we're going to bring her back. Right, right. 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 But right. if it's not her wishes, then how would we know that? Right. Okay, so that is good to know. A visible location. Okay, because she has the little card in her wallet, but who's going to go in your wallet? It's like it came with the package. Mm-hmm. So I was like, okay. She's like, well, then she took a copy of the whole, the left, the front page, and she has that folded up. She keeps that in her purse. And I, and so that's a good idea. I need to get it on the refrigerator. Yes. Where she yes. where she's at. Okay. So that it's it's visible. So you know, when the emergency technicians come into the home, they can see it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. She has a she has a housekeeper. Well well, I guess one I guess not a housekeeper, a caregiver that comes out and clean, and then we have a, a another um person that comes out, the nurse comes out and checks her. So that is good to know. So I will make sure my sister that is there get that in from get that and put it where it is visible so mm-hmm. that they all can see it know where it's at instead of because you know it's not, it's not like you're going to ask her <laughs> no you can't ask her and that's a conversation to have with the nurse that comes does the nurse realize that she has a dnr in place mm-hmm. so yes yeah, yeah, so the nurse knows um because she's come she's cause she's coming from her from her doctor's office so okay, good. Yeah, from that good. particular group Yes. So she nurse, the nurse knows, but I um, definitely need to get it on the refrigerator just in case there's a different nurse that comes and she doesn't, you know, right. doesn't know. Yes. Right. Okay. That is, see, I'm learning stuff today too. See, see guys. <laughs> <laughs> and there are benefits to having a health proxy. You want to um, name a couple of the benefits to having a health proxy? Well, I mean, it's just like I said, so the, the main benefit is that those healthcare um, decisions are going to be what you want them to be. So whether or not quality of life is more important to you or quantity of life is more important to you. Do you want to be an organ donor or not? It's normally in that those documents. And so um, is it okay for them to take any organ or is it that you only want certain organs gone? Is it okay for them to do research and education on you or is it I'm strictly an organ donor. So there's different levels of that that you can put in there. Um, You can also state in there, this is the one document, even though this is a living document, so a healthcare uh, power of attorney and healthcare proxies are only while you're alive and they normally terminate upon your death. But this one kind of carries over just just a little bit um, into the disposition of your body after you have passed away. So is it okay for them to perform an autopsy on you? Would you want to be embalmed and buried? Do you want to be cremated? What do you want to happen to your cremains? Is there a particular um, cemetery that you'd like to be 
buried in? Have you already made pre-arrangements? So all of those things are things that can be put into this into the healthcare proxy. There are several different types of healthcare proxies, like you just talked about a DNR. That's a little bit different than the healthcare power of attorney. Um, it's a little bit different from the post. It's different from a living will declaration. And I just I want to talk about a living will declaration yes. just really quickly. Um, I know a lot of people will call me and they'll say, I'd like to get a living will. That's not really what they want. They really want a last will and testament, but most people don't understand the difference between a last will and testament and a living will. So a last will and testament is what we were talking about before, what a will is, the disposition of your property and naming a guardian for your um, minor children or disabled adult children. Mm -hmm. A living will declaration is a healthcare proxy. And that is if you are terminal, so you are terminal and death is imminent, meaning that there's nothing that they can do for you that's going to prolong your life um, outside of artificial assistance. Mm -hmm. And so the artificial assistance is normally a feeding tube or ventilation. And most people who do not want those, they just want comfort care and allow it to pass naturally, but comfortably put in the living will declaration because it says, I don't want any of those things. I don't want any type of artificial assistance. I simply want comfort care. And so that is what a living will declaration is, which is a completely different document mm -hmm. than a last will and testament. That's good to know. That's good to know because I've heard other people talk about, well, I'm just going to give me a living will. Do you even know what a living will is? <laughs> Unfortunately, most people don't. <laughs> They don't. Mm -hmm. So I'll get the call and I'll say, okay, you want a living will declaration? Okay, this is what it is. And they'll say, no, that's not what I want at all. <laughs> right, right. So the terminology is really important to know the terminology and to know the difference between a will that is a last will and testament versus a living will. That is good. Now, off just the off second, because this just hurt, came to me. Um, one of my coworkers said that they have a living, is it, what you say, a living trust. So they're giving money away while they're alive to their kids and nieces and nephews. Is that, first of all, is there such thing as a living trust or is that, is that something she made up? Okay, so there is a living trust. So okay. she's talking about uh, a revocable living trust is what she's talking about. So a trust and it's revocable because it means you can change it and, it's, and you, um, you form it during your lifetime. So that's what she was re referring to. Now, as far as giving money away now, that's a little different from the trust. Now, that sounds like that she's making um, she's making gifts, which you are able to give up to fifteen thousand dollars to you know individuals to your children and whoever, and, and there's no gift taxes on that, and so that's a way to take certain assets out of your estate if you feel like you're going to hit that threshold where you're going to be paying um, estate taxes. Okay. So that's something that you do during your lifetime. And so it'll, you know, kind of spin down your estate. You're still making all the gifts that you want to make, but then they're able to use that money and not have to worry about estate taxes at the end. And so that's sort of a, a asset you know, um, strategy at the end. So it's a little bit different. I think probably on one of these, we, we should probably talk about yeah, the different talk about nuances it. of a, of a trust and, and what that does. And, and, um, so that's another tool that you can use, but that would be a whole nother conversation. So yes. we can talk about that. <laughs> yes. Yes. We will definitely be talking about that on another, on another series. Um, because that's, this is, this is all good information that we can use and that, you know, when we get to that, that, that threshold of income, you're like, okay, you know, especially if you don't have any dependents and you're at a certain um, tax bracket or, or income level, this is a great tool to use, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll definitely have this on another series um, for you all um, yeah. so that Polara can talk more in depth about this. Yeah, so we will. So that it sounds like what your coworker is doing is just a little bit different. And so that's probably something to do with estate taxes, but it probably is also something to do with her income taxes right now, because if you give those gifts away, then it obviously is, you know, spending down your income for the year. And so you're, you might put yourself in a lower tax bracket for your income taxes. So that's a, that's probably a whole nother conversation. <laughs> um, but 
Yeah. So it sounds like your coworker knows a little bit of this and a little bit of that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, our our company, one of the well, working for um, Alter Dominus, we get the opportunity um, they to attend these various investment classes and series and webinars and all this wealth of information about building wealth of course and so this was one of them and she was like I missed it because I think I I think I had surgery um, Uh they had this particular series so um and she was telling me about it and she was like oh I'm doing this now and I was like oh okay and because we were having this show um for this week I was like oh I gotta ask Pilar about that (laughs) So we'll definitely talk more about this because I I definitely want to know more and I'm pretty sure um, for those listening, you know, it will be beneficial to them as well. Yes. Now, um, a power of attorney. What is the purpose of having a power of attorney? Okay, so I'm thinking you're meaning a power of attorney for property, correct? Pro- yeah, for property or their finances. Is it that is that the same thing? Yes. Yes. So your power of attorney for property has to do with all of your assets. And again, this is another document while you are alive. However, you are just incapacitated for some reason. So you're unable to make these decisions for yourself. And so you have executed this document for a just in case. Um, And it allows that someone that you have named basically to step into your shoes and to continue to make all of your financial decisions for you. Um, There's a blanket of powers that are given within that power of attorney for property, um, but you can always add more um, powers, more authority. You can limit it as well. But it's important because you want someone to be able to access your assets. So that means you want someone to be able to access your your banking accounts, maybe to continue to pay your rent, continue to pay your your mortgage, to continue to pay your... um, your car payments. Um, you want someone, if you're in the middle of any type of acquisition, maybe I know you are thinking about sometime soon purchasing a home. Mm-hmm. Maybe you're in the process of that, but it's not completed. You want someone to be able to step into your shoes and to finish that contract for you so that mm-hmm. that deal doesn't fall um, fall away. So you don't lose that opportunity. So it's, it's really important If you have someone in place, I know a lot of times people kind of assume, again, we make these really bad assumptions Mm -hmm. um, that I have this checking account, but I'm married. And so my husband can get to my checking account. What are you talking about? It's fine. He can just go to the bank and he can say, I am Pilar's husband and they're going to give him the money and life is going to be roses. Unfortunately, that is not how that happens. (laughs) It doesn't work that way. They're going to say, Mr. Smith, it's so nice to meet you. You cannot have access to these funds. So it is really important that you have that document um, in place. Those assets are yours. The bank is under no obligation to work with anyone else, only you. It is their job to safeguard those funds on your behalf. And so it does not matter that a spouse or a child or whoever shows up at the bank and says, but I have the checkbook or I have the whatever. And she says, is okay. They're going to say, you need to go to court. You need to be appointed as a guardian. You need to come back with some documents for us, some letters of office for us, some ID, and then we'll have a conversation. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, So, but if you have that in place, then someone is able to carry on all of your financial affairs for your benefits. So that includes completing any type of applications you might be in the process of. That means, um, talking to, um, you know, like the utility company on your behalf or, mm-hmm. or whatever. Um, so anything that has to, to do with your finances, those things can carry on so that when you are well, mm-hmm. right, you are back in the place where you started. You're not trying to, you know, figure everything out and, and things have collapsed and fallen apart around you. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And here i got a quick question so you know how some states are community states is it is it is it is it community far as like community property community property so does that play a role when it comes to having access um, to your spouse's bank you know bank account like you said not while you are no not while you're alive like that so just because um so if you lived in a community property state and it says that this if my sole name is on the checking account, 
However, if we split, you are entitled to half of it because we are in a community property state. Mm -hmm. Yes, you are entitled to half of it. However, while I'm still alive and only my name is on the account, that spouse cannot go to the bank and say, <laughs> I'd like to withdraw all the funds out of this account. It still does not work that way simply because only my name is on the account. Yeah, okay. Right? But if we were in the in a divorce, I would have to present those funds just like any funds that was in a joint account. Okay. Right? And he is entitled to half of what's in that account. <laughs> he gets it. But while I'm alive and only my name is on it, he can't go to the bank and, and make those withdrawals. It's unfortunately it doesn't doesn't work that way. Okay, okay, okay. You know what? That's good to know. I think I, um I think maybe down the line too, one of another topic that we should probably talk about is prenups. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> why um, you should have one what should be in it well yeah mm -hmm. yeah we, we discussed that yeah we yeah because especially for women you know you're established you're, you're well established like myself I'm gonna use myself as an example mm -hmm. well established and you meet someone and you know you meet someone and, and you get married to that person and two years down the line you know you you know it doesn't work for whatever reason and you get divorced. And if, like you said, being a, com a community property state, he's entitled to half. Mm -hmm. So somebody can come along and only been around two years and take half of what you've worked so hard for. Yeah. And I think about that every day. And in my mind, I said, if I ever get married, he will have to sign a prenup. A prenup. Yes, because I've worked too hard. I've built a, a retirement pension and I have, a, you know, I'll have property. I have a business. I'm not going to have someone come along and just literally take half of that. And some, you know, I guess, you know, I'm not saying everybody's like this, but I have a friend who went through a, a nightmare of a divorce and she had a business and he didn't care about their business the whole time they were married. Didn't care about it. And in the divorce, he wanted to be um, partner. He knew nothing about the business. That, nothing about the industry, nothing about the business, nothing. He wanted to be a part of this business just to, like, just to be, dis, be spiteful, I think. At least that's my opinion. But she worked so hard building her business. She had had this business for 20 years for someone to come along to... You know, you want to be married for five years, five. Uh, they weren't married long. Okay. And to come along and you get half. Oh, I hate to hear that. But this is one of those things that we can learn from her experience. Mm -hmm. And you know that preparation. Yep. Um, and forethought can go a long way. Mm -hmm. And Prenups do not have to be something that is seen as very negative. Right. Um, it can be a very open and honest conversation. Um, these are things that you should be able to talk with your future forever spouse about anyway, right. um, to communicate how you are feeling about things. And this is why you'd like for this to happen. I think sometimes when we don't, speak clearly about things um that's when some of the issues can come into play mm -hmm. but if if she had been very realistic going into their relationship and not that you are going into anything thinking that it will fail mm -hmm. but just having the forethought that it's a possibility that mm -hmm. something could go wrong there's a possibility um that the relationship could fall apart or if your spouse predeceased you what would that look like um for his estate mm -hmm. what comes to you what goes to his family if this is a, a marriage um if your friend was around our age and so <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit later in life mm -hmm. um and so there are other elements that may be there maybe he had children from a previous relationship mm -hmm. Um, maybe he just had other responsibilities. And so then what does that look like mm -hmm. if that spouse predeceases her? What what happens to his obligations? What, right. 
right? And so how does that impact her? And I don't think that that's a bad conversation and, and, you know, things to have. And so I think that you are thinking smart and that what you have built and what you want that to look like. And so in these documents, there's a way to absolutely very much so take care of your spouse, Mm -hmm. right? Still take care of your spouse, but also protect your assets. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Especially, especially if you have property that was, um, cause she had, um, her grandmother, the, her grandmother's house was left. It's been passed down to all the girls generation to generation to generation. And this is a house that's been, and there is a will, you know, her grandmother had a will, thank God. Um, <laughs> and so that's been passed down, but he even tried to go after, I mean, he wanted half he, he wanted everything he wanted you know he tried to demand that she sell that um property that was you know um left to her from her grandmother and thank god that that you know she got that inherited through another you know from her grandmother he couldn't take that she fought very hard that he wow. couldn't get it yeah wow. he got every he got a lot of he got he got um he's partners he um got partnership into the business and he really didn't want it. You know what he ended up doing? He told her he'll give her the business. She had to buy him out. Mm, wow. And it was, it was just a really big headache and she did. She bought him out and she's like, she sold property just to buy him out. So th- this is one of those things that if they had talked about it beforehand, mm-hmm. then these are things that could have been put into the prenuptial agreement Mm -hmm. Um, and then it wouldn't have been so emotional and so heated because they'd already agreed when they both were more level-headed unfortunately when we get to the point where the relationship has come to an end there's a lot of hurt feelings yeah a lot of angry feelings um, if it's not a mutual split and so sometimes you do find yourself in these situations where people are behaving in ways that they would not normally yes behave in and so it does turn out to not be beneficial to anyone involved. But mm-hmm. when you are bringing significant things to the relationship, um, I think it's really important to talk about that up front. Yeah. You know, it's worth yeah. having a conversation about it up front. Even if you decide not to have a prenuptial agreement, mm-hmm. you still need to have a conversation about it up front. What should this look like? And maybe the two of you, if you don't do a prenup, you do your estate planning together and then estate planning is done in such a way, right? That a lot of those things are addressed. So you're not planning in case there's going to be a split the estate planning won't plan for that, but it will plan for if um, someone, either of you passed away, what would that look like for each other? Mm -hmm. What would that look like for your other obligations? Like I said, if you had children that you were supporting, parents that you were supporting, or whoever, you know, sometimes there are situations where people are helping to support their siblings, Mm -hmm. um, or parents, because they're elderly, or they're ill, so you put those things into place, and then hopefully you can avoid some of the hurt feelings, um, some of the neglect, Mm -hmm. and you can still live up to those obligations. Absolutely, absolutely. Oh, yes. This is good. This is really good today. I, I really like this. Um, <laughs> there's going to be a lot coming from us over the next couple months. Y'all. I'm looking forward to it. I am too. I mean, this is so good. So tell our listeners how they can get in touch with you and learn more about what we've talked about today. Um, we, I feel like we need to have a part two on this whole wheel thing. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay, we can do that. So I would say, um, again, I just want to reiterate what you said earlier. I guess if, if people have questions or interest, please put it in the what do we comments, our notes, and things so that we can respond and and it'll give us ideas for um, future conversations that we're having as well. Yes. Right? So you can reach me a couple of different ways. So the easiest way to find me is on my website. So you can go to www.hendersonsmithlaw, so H-E-N-D-E-R-S-O-N-S-M-I-T-H-L-A-W.com. And all of my information is there. So um, there's a direct numbers if you wanted to give me a call, but um, you can reach me there. You can go to my calendar and schedule a consultation or a talk. So all that's on my, my website. 
Um, you can also find me on Facebook under uh, Henderson Smith Law. I'm on uh, LinkedIn under Polara Henderson Smith. I think I'm on, I know I'm on Instagram. I think it's under Polara Smith. Um, you can find me lots of different ways. You, there's not anybody else that I've met who's named Polara. So if you type in Polara, it'll probably <laughs> pop up on you. If you just do a basic search for Polara Henderson Smith, you, you'll find me. Absolutely, absolutely. And you can also um, join our podcast group. It's called Sisters Conversations Podcast with Latrice Carter. Um, the, the group title is actually Sisters Conversations Podcast. Join the group. It's a, um, it's a public group. Join it. Uh, we drop the replay in there every thir- um, every every Thursday. It automatically loads to um, our Sisters Place page, and it's uh, and you know wherever you listen to podcasts, whether it be Spotify, Apple, iHeartRadio, you name it. We're on like fifteen different streaming channels across the globe, so we are heard. So make sure you um, tune in that, you know, tune in there. So let's, um, go with our closing remarks. Polara, you have any closing remarks for today's show? Well, um, Latrice, first, I just want to say thanks for doing this, for having this idea to have this conversation. Um, I'm excited about what these next few months will look like. Um, I hope that people enjoyed today and got a wealth of information. And please do reach out to both of us with um, questions or comments. We are definitely here for you trying to serve the community. And it's like, that's my, my big thing. I want to educate and want to serve. So any, any questions that I can help answer, any way I can help guide you, direct you, please reach out. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, um, it's, you know, 2021 for me, I said, I want to be more informative. I want to be more empowering uh, and I want to have an impact on the black community because this is our community. And if we don't help educate our people, nobody else is. Absolutely. There's a wealth of this information that we're sharing on sisters conversations that I feel is lacking in our community. So I want you guys to use us as a resource um, so that you can get this information so that we can be better. You know, 2021, 2020 was hard. It was rough and it was traumatizing too, um, to say the least. Um, But 2021, I want us as a community to move forward in such a positive manner that we are not just about being entertaining, but we're about being um, impactful and being change agents so that we can have an effect on our people. You know, there's other ethnic groups that they, their communities come together and they hold each other's down. And that's what I, I feel in my heart that we as a black community need to do. It's time for us to come together, y'all. It's time for us to hold each other accountable. It's time for us to hold each other up as well. But it's also time for us to educate us and eliminate the ignorance around having a will, having the power of attorney and health, care, health, having um, a health proxy, just having life insurance. I mean, like I said, we're going to talk about these topics in every, every series coming every fourth Thursday. So just set it on your calendar, put it on your phone as a reminder, fourth Thursday, Sisters Conversations, 6 p.m. Central Standard Time, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time is when our show airs. Make sure you tune in and get your notebook ready. Go visit Polaris website, join our group, ask questions. We are here to be informative. We are here to serve our Black community. So thank you all for being listening, being, you know, tuning in. And Palara, thank you for this wealth of information. I love you to death, girl. (laughs) Thank you. I love you too. I love you. Love you too. This is great. Just want to say one more thing. I mean, after listening to you just now, just think of this as our first step in this, um, and leaving a legacy, right? Yes. This is the 
first step, the first building block in figuring out how do we leave a lasting impression, a lasting legacy for our brothers and sisters, for the Black community. We can do it. We have the resources. It's just a matter of taking the first step. Absolutely. Absolutely. So with that said, you guys, we will talk to you again next month, fourth Thursday. It's going to be a great show. Until then, be blessed, stay safe. and be Thanks to our special guests for joining the show today. Be sure to follow us on your favorite streaming channel so you don't miss a show. We can be heard on Spotify, Apple, iHeartRadio, Spreaker, and YouTube at Sista's Place. Visit our website, www.sistasplace.com, to learn more about us.